Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the 18th International Conference on Artificial Intelligence and Law. Uh, my name is Andrea Gualcieri. I am PhD in Philosophy of Law uh, at Pontifical Catholic University in Sao Paulo. And I'm delighted to be the host of this panel. Uh, this is the fifth panel uh, of the fourth day of the, the event of the fourth day of uh, ICAIU. And also in name of ICAIU organization, I'd like to thank our platinum sponsors, uh, Jus Brasil and Albert Einstein Israeli Hospital, our gold sponsors, Logoritim, Legal Code, and PJ, PJ Lawyers, and our silver sponsors, uh, Urbano Vitalino Lawyers, Opsi Bloom Lawyers, and Oasis Open. Uh, well, uh, for our first, first uh, presentation, uh, we will have uh, Mark, Mark Kress. Um, Mark is a PhD candidate uh, from the Department of Political Science uh, at Stanford, United States. And uh, it's a pleasure to uh, hear uh, the, the work that uh, Mark uh, will present for us, uh, which name is Context Aware Legal Citation Recommendation Using Deep Learning. Um, Mark, uh, it's my pleasure to have you here. Uh, we are ready to, to hear you whenever you want. Uh, thanks. I'm also joined here by Dan Ho, who uh, uh, is one of the co-PIs on the paper. Um, oh, so, so, sorry, sorry, Dan. Uh, uh, and, and Dan Ho also uh, will, uh, I, I think Dan uh, will answer the questions. Am I right? Or my present with you? My understanding is that we're going to restream the presentation from yesterday, and then both Dan and I will field questions at the end. OK, uh, so, so sorry. So uh, then Ho uh, uh, will present uh, the paper uh, with Mark. And uh, then is uh, the William Benjamin Scott and Luna M. Scott Professor of Law, uh, Professor of Political Science, Senior Fellow at the Stanford, Stanford Institute for Economic, Economic Policy Research, uh, Associate Director for the Stanford Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence, and uh, Director of Regulation, Evaluation, and Governance Lab. So uh, whenever you want, uh, it's a pleasure to, to hear your presentation work with uh, students at uh, Carnegie Mellon, uh, Zahan Charles, Mengchu, and Hongyi, as well as a JD PhD student uh, here at Stanford, Mark Krass. Uh, and we're uh, really uh, sort of excited to share this uh, with you. The motivation for this work is uh, the well-documented problems of mass adjudication. Uh, less, a less known fact about the US judicial system is that government agencies adjudicate far more cases than all the federal courts combined. Even a single agency like the Social Security Administration hears a, a half million cases annually. And that has led to really uh, uh, profound challenges in uh, uh, the administration of justice, where going back to uh, close to 50 years to Jerry Mashaw's work, we know that the identity of who the administrative law judge is matters greatly, and in his uh, view, even more uh, uh, than the facts of the case, such that award rates plotted here can range between close to 0% to 100%, depending on the assignment of the administrative law judge, leading some scholars to decry this as a form of disability roulette. Uh, 
This is what the file room of a recent mass adjudicatory agency in the American system, the Board of Veterans Appeals that we're going to study here, looked like as of a number of years ago. Um, and so that came with really profound challenges, both in terms of the caseload, wait times for veterans uh, uh, exceeding five years from the time a notice of disagreement, uh, a notice of appeal was filed until resolution. Um, and here from some data that James Ridgway, uh, who used to be at the BVA, uh, presented, the result of this kind of inc increased uh, caseload was that staff attorneys had about 10 to 15 seconds uh, per page of the record, and veterans law judges with uh, larger uh, staff uh, reporting to them had about 45 to 60 minutes for review per uh, written appeal, um, such that in 2018, uh, a survey uh, uh, revealed that 90% of the staff attorneys reported having inadequate time to review the record. Um, and uh, that is really the kind of motivation for the kind of work uh, we're doing here. It seems to have, uh, yeah, uh, where we're going to look at uh, these uh, BVA decision texts, so all texts from 1988 to 2017, um, about uh, 750,000 decisions, and we're going to focus uh, on single issue uh, cases, um, and we're going to bring in uh, some metadata from the internal system, uh, and also uh, use the Harvard Case Law Access Project uh, to to uh, combine and 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 really uh, 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 figure out whether there are ways in which we can use advances in natural language processing to really help uh, improve the accuracy and consistency of this uh, uh, process. For those of you who are wondering what VACL stands for. It's the internal database that the Board of Veterans Appeals actually uses to move cases along. And it literally stands for the Veterans Appeals Control uh, uh, locator, object locator system, because it's literally the system that was used to try to figure out which room a file was located in. Um, and so we've got uh, basic information about claims and uh, diseases spanning the years 2009 to 2017, and close to 300 uh, uh, identifiers for veterans law judges. Um, and the basic way we're going to try to tackle this is to really see whether we can develop methods for better citation and application of precedent during opinion drafting, given the quality and consistency challenges in mass adjudication. So the kind of hypothesis, whether we can predict, uh, build an ML system that really recommends citations that are specific to a case uh, context. Um, a little bit of motivation here is if you look at the existing kind of uh, uh, trends in large language models, if you turn to a model like GPT-2, you can prompt it with a statement like the following, as the preponderance of the evidence is against the claim, the benefit of the doubt doctrine is not applicable and the claim must be denied. And GPT-2 actually returns what look like pretty sensible sets of citations here uh, that might be seen to support the statement. Uh, it respects the order of authorities as spelled out in the blue book. These look like roughly properly formatted uh, sort of citations. The only small problem is these are citations to cases that don't actually exist. Um, so there are still major advances that have to be made here. The actual kind of target uh, would be Gilbert versus Derwinski for this particular statement about the, the benefit of the doubt doctrine. Uh, similarly, another kind of example here would be a statement about material evidence. Material evidence means evidence that by itself or when considered with, a previous, with previous evidence of record related to an unestablished fact necessary to substantiate the claim. The kind of typical citation would be to the code of federal uh, regulations. Um, and with that motivation, I'll turn it over to, to Matthias to talk about our technical approach to really solve this challenge. I'm muting myself. Okay, thank you very much, Dan. Um, I will present the uh, our technical approach now. And uh, the first thing we do in our pipelines, so for, uh, again, thank you uh, for having us at this wonderful conference. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'll present the technical approach. I hope um, my microphone's working. Um, the first thing we do in this project um, in its technical uh, pipeline is to pre-process the BVA decisions um, in our corpus. 
We do that using a comprehensive set of regular expression extractors that um, pull out citations uh, to cases, uh, uh, the United States Code and the Code of Federal Regulations. We mask those citations in the text and uh, forward the decisions with the mask citations to our tokenizer um, stage. Parallel to that, we take the raw citations that were extracted and apply a normalization procedure that resolves those citations to either um, the case law access uh, metadata corpus, specifically the VET app and F3 reporter. Um, we also normalize uh, citations to uh, the United States Code and the CFR in a way that I'll explain in a moment, and hence assemble um, a comprehensive normalized citation vocabulary from which we draw the relevant citations and merge the decision back um, after having been, uh, after tokenization. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, so the okay, I'm getting a message that the video doesn't work. So I, I see am, you now. Okay, we see me. Okay, sorry. Um, so um, I'll just walk back to. Um, thank you for the pointer. Um, this is the graph I was supposed to be showing. So again, decisions come in. We um, extract um, citations, mask them, feed things into the tokenizer, in para and in parallel take the raw citations, apply our normalization procedure, and remerge. Uh, those citations. Thank you for um, uh, uh, raising my awareness to this issue. Um, to illustrate the citation normalization, we uh, take our uh, we take case citations which we identify by the reporter name, the volume, and the page number, and we use um, case law access metadata corpus to uh, identify a, a unique ID that we can resolve this case to, and all versions of referring to, say, Dekmatich v. Brown, are then resolved to this lemma. Uh, uh, citations to the CFR and the UN United States Code um, are de decomposed into um, the prefix and the tail, where the tail is then segmented into individual elements. Um, and so um, a full citation string becomes a list of normalized atomic citations. And using this procedure, we're able to uh, boil down um, the 97,000 unique citations in our training da data to about 4,300. Uh, 4,000 of which are normalized according to this distribution. We get um, a, a total normalization coverage about, of about 98.5% of the 5 million instances in our training data, which we think is fairly good. So the formal definition of our task is then to take a tokenized context segment um, from our decision, which may include already some special tokens such as paragraph breaks or other citations, and to predict um, in a delimited forecasted window, forecast window, the index of the next citation in there, so in this case here, 132. Um, as Dan has mentioned, this could be considered a text generation task. However, as we've seen um, in the example before, it's hard to generate um, full citation strings. So we treat this as a class classification task, which is the slightly easier task to make incremental progress with. Um, of course, citation recommendation is a well-studied problem. Um, for general and scientific literature recommendations, predominant approaches are collaborative filtering, graph-based and context-based models. There's also some work being done um, in the legal, legal AI sphere, specifically often in conjunction with uh, legal citation networks. There's also proprietary systems such as case text parallel search or Thomson Reuters quick check, et cetera. I'll refer you to the paper for details, but I do want to acknowledge the basic collaborative filtering and context-based approaches because this is what we are using in our model. As a baseline, we use a collaborative filtering model. So instead of um, one, instead of one receiving uh, being a user and receiving, say, movie recommendations on Netflix, you are. Uh, opinions here get recommended citations. To do that, we treat a case opinion as an, a bag of citations, which allows us to um, compute distance measures to other cases. And then um, additional recommendations are scored according to this distance metric. And the metadata um, Dan had alluded, has explained um, will is added uh, using an S uh, and is aggregated uh, using an SVM ranking module from which we then predict um, uh, the citations. Our next model then adds co uh, textual context to it by representing um, the text preceding the citations as a uh, bag of words um, in a TF-IDF vectorization. And we 
recommend citations by computing similarity from a query context to the contexts in the training data and the citations that follow them. Again, metadata is added to the model via uh, um, as part of an input to an SVM ranking module. Our first full-blown NLP model is a by LSTM, which uh, reads the citation context back and forth and um, gets its encoding concatenated with um, the metadata and fed into a classification head, which then predicts into the vocabulary size. Similarly, we take a pre-trained English, an English pre-trained Roberta model, um, which is a stack transformer architecture, which encodes the context, concatenates the encoding with the case metadata again, and feeds it into a classification head, um, which projects into the vocabulary size. Um, this leaves uh, brings us to our results. Um, so we evaluate recall at five, 1, 5, and 20. So the probability that our model predicts the correct citation in the top 1, top 5, and top 20 um, site recommendations. And our primary results are in the neural models are for context sizes of 256 and forecast sizes of 128 tokens. Uh, the first thing we see here is that um, our neural models, of course, um, unsurprisingly outperform our non-NLP models um, with recall at one in the mid 60s, recall at five in the lower uh, 80s, and recall at 20 in the low 90s. Um, we also observe that um, the, the Roberta model, despite being pre-trained, only uh, does consistently perform better than the by LSTM model, but only by at most 1% and usually within uh, plus minus two standard deviations across our six test folds. So pre-training, uh, the limits of the benefits of pre-training are marginal here. Um, what's also partially not shown here, and I would refer you to the paper for that, is that there is no cons uh, the benefit of metadata influences training, but there is no consistent benefit in adding it in the different architectures. Um, this is an this is a, an area where we intend to uh, conduct research in the future, and again, the details of the results that we observed are in the paper. If we take our best performing Roberta model and we uh, run it over time, we observe that um, the model performs um, equally um, for case regulation, equally well for case regulation and statute um, citations, and also fairly stable across time with this little oscillation down here, um, we conjecture being uh, due to a change in uh, veterans law. We also observe the, de the decline of the model performance as the distance to the citation in the forecast window increases. Um, this decline is of course more sharp uh, for uh, recall at one than it is for recall at five and recall at 20. Still, so we do see some evidence here that the model is probably engaging in a fair amount of memorization of textual context specifically for uh, verbal and verbatim quotations of the sources before the occurrence of the actual citation. Still, the fairly gradual decline of recall at five, which is sort of the use the we consider the most representative use case scenario, um, suggests to us that the model does learn some amount of um, long distance patterns and that it's a promising approach, technical approach to treat citation recommendation, at least in part as a classification problem and benefit from supervision signal rather than treating it just as a pure um, encoding similarity retrieval um, model, a retrieval approach. Finally, we uh, did an ablation experiment and uh, Mark Krass uh, produced this graph here. First, please look at the right um, half here where we compare models that um, predict 64 tokens into the future and models that predict 128 tokens into the future. So the upper quadrant is easy and the lower quadrant is hard. And we can see that if we give the model more context, uh, larger context as we move to the right, um, the increased slope here shows us that the model performs better the more context we give it. And for the easier task up here, the slower, the more flat slope here shows us that it, for predicting 64 tokens ahead, giving the system more context doesn't help as much. The only other piece of information here before I hand it back to Dan is if you compare this to the left half of the model, of this graph where we uh, uh, graph models that do not have access to metadata, we notice that if you are in the hardest task, which is you predict 128 tokens from a short context, um, actually, if you give the system metadata, so we're comparing these two spots, performance improves 
uh, a bit, which means that if the model has to predict very far in, in advance and has little context, it may actually benefit from some metadata, but this benefit um, it becomes uh, disappears more or less the more context you give it. And with that, I will hand it back over to Dan. Great. Um, if you uh, just go to the next slide, uh, Matthias. Uh, so we think we've shown uh, the utility of this kind of a context-based citation recommendation system. And it's particularly notable that uh, in the kind of more sophisticated models, the benefits to adding metadata were really uh, kind of marginal. There are, of course, lots of other really interesting legal implications when we think about this kind of a system for AI-assisted adjudication, both in terms terms of uh, the due process values and the decisional authority. Um, that is, do you start to, for instance, reallocate decisional authority for locating relevant precedent away from the staff attorneys of veterans law judges toward uh, the uh, engineers who are building out a system like this, uh, which of course relates to the much broader conversation that many of us are engaged in, in terms of algorithmic uh, governance. Um, if you go to the next slide, uh, uh, Matthias, I think the kind of concrete use case here really does come from the Social Security Administration, where Gerald Ray, uh, who was head of the Appeals Council, had started to hire attorneys who also happened to have uh, data science and software engineering backgrounds, had them learn the adjudication process, and then had them start to build out simple prototypes uh, that led to sort of the first NLP-based error detection system where staff attorneys and judges can input a draft decision and get around 30 quality flags, such as the, the one depicted here, that starts to use both heuristic and machine learning uh, ways of spotting internal inconsistencies within the decision like the, the one here. Um, if you could go ahead uh, and advance um, to the next slide, that of course then is what is one of the biggest kind of potential upsides to this kind of a system is that one could go back to the original diagnosis provided by Jerry Mashaw of these kinds of NLP based systems as really fostering better forms of bureaucratic justice in the kind of internal management system uh, that Professor Mashaw had talked about, um, which connects to some of the, the broader work about uh, the ways in which uh, government agencies are starting to rely on forms of artificial intelligence uh, to improve uh, uh, governance functions within the public sector. With that, uh, we'll uh, uh, leave it open for questions. Okay, uh, we can go now uh, to questions and answers. Uh, we have uh, a question for uh, yesterday presentation. Uh, and this question, uh, let me find the question here. But the question is, uh, you are mentioning a change in the law as Andre, do you want me to try to uh, read it? Um, I think this was a question from Kevin Ashley, uh, who asked, uh, you mentioned a change in the law as possibly causing a jag in the graph of results. Have you identified a specific change in the law? Yeah. Yes. So I'm happy to take a stab at that question. Um, so uh, uh, we did sort of identify two major sort of spikes in the um, accuracy of, uh, or in the sort of recall rates or uh, performance in our model. One was in the early 2000s where there was a big spike in uh, case recall. And one is at the very end of our study period where we see a bit of a decline uh, in case recall. And uh, we sort of have explanations for both, but I'm not sure that either of them 
or, or at least the second one um, relates to a change in precedent. So the first JAG, the big spike in recall, uh, we think that has to do with um, a change in the law that came uh, as a result of the Veterans Claims Assistance Act, which created a bunch of new procedural requirements um, for the Board of Veterans Appeals and the Veterans Administration in their duty to assist applicants um, for benefits. And over the subsequent years, there were a bunch of um, decisions interpreting the agency's responsibilities under that act. So in particular, there was this one case in 2002 called Quartu Quartuccio versus Principi, um, which changed the standard um, for how the VA had to notify claimants um, of, uh, of, of the agency's position on their case. And when those decisions came out, it was basically found that all of the letters the VA, the VA had sent out were, were defective at the same time. So was, there was this process by which, um, you know, a whole bunch of decisions uh, were basically issued at the exact same time and for the exact same reason, which is that they shared the same procedural defect under this new decision, Quartucho versus Principi. Um, and so that explains sort of the spike in recall because you had a bunch of sort of form uh, of form decisions that were all saying the same thing. So those were easier to predict. And then um, the decline in recall at the end of the series, uh, we think that just has to do with the fact with the sort of cold start issue, which is that newer cases are cited fewer times. And so uh, uh, they're a little bit harder, uh, harder to predict. So hopefully that answers the question. Okay. I think that was a great, that was a nice answer, uh, Mark. Maybe just to chime in a little bit uh, there, because I think it relates to a question that was asked during one of the earlier panels about the interesting modeling challenges going forward. And, and we think it really does center on uh, the cold start problem, as Mark described it, or as a form of concept drift. That is, if we can show that there's very good uh, performance of a system like this when the law is stable, what do you do when something like the Veterans Claims uh, assistance act is passed that may affect uh, the sort of uh, kinds of cases that uh, uh, statutes and regulations that one should really uh, recommend. And that to us is a really exciting uh, uh, path forward of how one build, builds in that kind of adaptability into a system like this. Okay, uh, we have another question for you. Uh, what is the reasoning for including a forecast in the prediction as well as the specific citation? I'm happy to take a stab at that one. I think it's a good question. So uh, if people may remember the part in the presentation where we kind of give the example data instance where there is context and then there's a, a forecast window which, can in, which will include the citation. Um, and I think this question is, is asking, you know, why not kind of, in a sense, simplify the task and take the context all the way up until the citation token and only do uh, the, the uh, prediction of the, the kind of next token. And I think the reasons here really, I, I think, are, are, are twofold. Um, the, the first is that as a practical matter, what we're envisioning is a system that can really help with this broad challenge of mass adjudication uh, where uh, staff attorneys or veterans law judges have to process a huge volume of cases and need real-time feedback that can help them in the writing process. And so that doesn't necessarily mean that you go up all the way until you've written a legal proposition and then you're finding the citation for it. It can be anticipatory. So in a sense, we're making the task uh, harder here, uh, which is sort of the... the um, the maybe the second uh, uh, point here, uh, uh, which is uh, that uh, uh, we want to make the task harder because if you already had quoted from a particular case, for instance, uh, you know, in a sense, you, it would be uh, not very useful to have uh, the, the citation recommended because you've obviously pulled a, a quote or a proposition uh, from somewhere already. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if Mark, you have anything else to add to, to, to that question. No, I think that's exactly right. I mean, I think the the tricky thing here, um, this is you know uh, from earlier comments on this paper, uh, people people have pointed this out is by the time you get right up until the citation, frequently you will already know what the right case is because you couldn't have written the last sentence in, unless you did. And so forecasting farther out is really, as Dan said, about uh, you know sort of improving the use case for this technology for people who are actually exploring 
the, the right legal standard that they should be using uh, rather than just sort of um, citing for a proposition that's already correct. It's to us also probably one of the really exciting future tasks, which is to uh, not just provide citation recommendation, but to ideally also provide uh, contextualization of uh, that citation. So for instance, uh, if we th thought about this as a, as a language generation uh, task, could one predict uh, the kind of parenthetical statement that would show the relevance of a case citation to the particular case at hand? Um, that's another really exciting uh, direction uh, to go in, I think, with generative models. Okay, uh, so I think this was uh, the last question. And uh, thanks to Mark and thanks to Professor Dan Dan Ho. And it was an uh, an excellent uh, explanation and it was a pleasure to hear you. And I think we can uh, go to our second uh, paper now. Uh, we will play uh, a video of the this second uh, presentation uh, that will be uh, explainable artificial intelligence lawyers perspective by uh, lucas gorski uh, lucas is a phd in university of uh, warsaw uh, he he works in Inter interdisciplinary cent center for mathematical and computational modeling. And uh, after uh, the video that uh, we will play uh, with uh, Lucas's speech, uh, we we also open for questions. And let me be begin. Explainability has always been at the heart of artificial intelligence and law curriculum. The growing popularity of deep learning methods makes inquiry into deep learning explainability even more important. Moreover, it is of value not only in artificial intelligence and law, but also in general artificial intelligence research. In this work, we aim to to quantify and test the usefulness of different explainability methods when applied to the area of legal text specification. Those methods were evaluated using the opinions coming from the legal professionals. This work was performed by Sashika Ramakrishna for, from Free University Berlin, as well as by me, and I am currently employed at the Interdisciplinary Center for Mathematical and Computational Modeling at the University of Warsaw. This talk will be structured as follows. Firstly, I will start the presentation by stating the research question, and I will also refer to our previous work to fully present the motivation before the research undertaken here. Secondly, I will talk about the computer system we have designed and implemented for our experimental explanation generation. The discussion of systems architecture will be supplemented by the review of data set that was used. Finally, I will describe the results of the pilot study that we conducted based on the explanations generated by our system. Uh, so to begin, when the motivation is concerned, it should be noted that this work is a significant extension of our previous paper presented at the XILA workshop during the previous Jurix conference with extended version accepted into ICOL proceedings. In this aforementioned paper, uh, we have presented a classification system that was based on convolutional neural network. And that system used GraphCam method to highlight the most important words when doing the legal text classification. However, the choice of GraphCam as an explanation method was somewhat arbitrary. And in the work presented here, we explored different methods of expansion generation for convolutional neural networks. Thus, with the work presented here, we aim to give a more structured and rigorous means of assessing different existing explainability methods. In general, there are three main categories of methods that can be employed for convolutional neural network based explanation generation. Firstly, already mentioned GRADCAM 
uh, is commonly used in computer vision. It uses the gradient of the target concept that flow into the final convolutional layer, and it produces a coarse localization maps that highlight the most important regions in input data uh, that were the most important for predicting the concept. The second method that is presented here is SHAP. It is a game theoretic approach that uh, aims to explain the output of any machine learning model, and it generates explanations using the Shapley values from game theory and their related extension. And thirdly, LIME is an example of surrogate model-based diagnostic, and it builds a local interpretable model based on the perturbation of input data fed to the model. Thus, to sum up, in our research, we wanted to uncover what lawyers thinks, uh, think of uh, explainable artificial intelligence systems and of the methods that can be used in those systems. The tech cloud presented on this slide comes from the survey we have circulated among legal professionals where we ask them uh, about their views on what features they would desire from explainable artificial intelligence based system. Generally, they talked mainly about tools that will take the burden of manual work away from, from the lawyer. Many people mentioned a transparent decision process, but as will be shown later in my talk, the conceptualization of transparency varied in the opinions given by various respondents. Another thing that uh, may be noted is that when we ask about explainable artificial intelligence, many respondents were talking about the general artificial intelligence system. Thus, they were viewing those two terms as, in a way, synonymous. And in conclusion, we, we may say that explainability for a lawyer is a crucial feature of the system, and it is indispensable in, in their mind, and it, should, and it is a necessary element of any artificial intelligence-based system. For, for law that, that can be used by the lawyers. Moving on to the methodology, we have built a modular system. In its heart, it has a convolutional neural network. Like here. The implementation of the networks that we have used was sourced from an external authors and used with their permission. We have used the system developed by Hebin Shin uh, which was based on theoretical insights from Yun Kim. Our core contributions to the system is the extension of the embedding module to support various embeddings, like what to vec or BERT. Secondly, we have introduced uh, artificial intelligence and law-based data sets to the system. Uh, and thirdly, we have added pre-processing tools uh, as well as a metric comparison module. This metric comparison module is based on the insights from computer vision and uses a well-known set of metrics uh, to, to generate insights into how the system works. In the experiments that we present here, the convolutional network was trained on the PTSD dataset. For testing purposes, we allow a user to choose a variety of embeddings. However, in this research, we have settled down on using distributed based embeddings. Though other versions of the systems I have already said allow to, uh, to choose another set of embeddings. The part that will be crucial in this presentation is the fact that the CNN module was coupled with the visualization module, which generates heat map. Uh, that show the most important words that impact the classification of the convolutional network. Uh, for this paper, we have explored how can the visualization module be extended to accommodate different kinds of explanation generation methods. In addition to GradCam, which came out of the box in the CNN implementation that we have sourced, we have coded a sharp and line explanation generation module. In the remainder of this presentation, we will focus on those additions and how they were assessed by the evaluation group that consisted of professional lawyers. As for the dataset used, as already mentioned, 
we have settled down on using the well-known PTSD dataset. It is a collection of 50 judgments coming from the US Board of Veteran Appeals. Each sentence of those judgments was annotated by, hum uh, by human annotators according to the rhetorical role that those sentences play in the judgments. There were six roles distinguished and the exemplary sentences are shown at the bottom of this slide. Our convolutional network was trained on this set and we achieved relatively good accuracy of about 83%. Though we really did not focus on the efficiency of the classification task as our main aim was user-based evaluation. Nevertheless, we conclude that those, uh, those uh, results in terms of accuracy are already satisfactory and we believe that they can be improved down the line uh, when more work is put uh, in this area. The most important part for this presentation was the fact that the network was used to generate explanations in the form of heat maps as presented here on the slide. Each me explanation method generated a distinctive set of heat maps. We have chosen six sentences from the PTSD test set that were correctly uh, classified by the network and explanations were generated for each of those sentence types, uh, like three explanations were generated each for GradCam, Sharp and Line. To assess the usefulness of those explanations, we have prepared a survey which was circulated among legal professionals. They were instructed that the computer marked the parts of the sentences which were the most decisive for making a decision regarding the classification. The lawyers were then subsequently asked to grade each of the explanations on a scale 0 to 10, with 0 being worst and 10 being the best. Uh, the slide uh, that is presented now uh, presents an overview of the results for a sample sentence. Next to the sentence's heat map, uh, we present the average user score as well as the resulting, uh, as well as the, uh, and we have also um, assessed the explanations in terms of the metric that comes from a computer vision. In the paper, we give a set of two metrics. Here, for this slide, we show the metric, which in full is called fraction of elements of relative threshold. And, the, uh, and this metric represents what portion of input data was taken into account by the CNN. It can be clearly seen that Sharp highlighted the whole sentence, while GradCam was the most selective method. So uh, there were differences in our respondents' assessment of various methods. Statistical analysis shows that those differences were not statistically important. Therefore, it can be said that uh, all the methods were assessed by our respondents similarly. And when deciding what method to use in a computer system, um, other factors should be taken into account. For example, from a software engineering point of view, it should be noted that implementation of certain methods is dependent not only on user's voice, but also on technical feasibility. GradCam is a method that, to the best of our knowledge, works only with convolutional networks. LIME is a method that is dependent on a number of hyperparameter values. And there are papers that suggest that it can be tweaked to the point of showing anything that the programmer wants. Uh, as well as the technical merit is concerned, we have used open source libraries for implementation of different methods and have found that the quality of implementation is varying Thus, this may also be a factor that can be taken into account. And finally, let me make some additional remarks. Uh, let's return to the example that was shown on the previous slide. Here, it can be spotted the results between different explainable uh, artificial intelligence methods vary widely. For example, when I have seen the results coming from Sharp, my first comment was that it has gone ballistic. Yet, there was a disagreement between the respondents and eight, for eight of them said that the results for the citation sentence given by the SHAP were the best, while nine experts have 
graded it as the worst. Thus, there seems to be an implicit disagreement between different respondents as what exactly is the best explanation. This can be further strengthened by different comments that we have received from the respondents uh, after performing the survey. For example, one of the respondents has said that he did not do this part of the survey at all because he was confused by what those colorful words were supposed to mean. On the other hand, the other expert has said that it made him question how things as a lawyer, because uh, well, this classification task is something that he would do intuitively. He had implicit mental model of the, of the task and our, our survey made him question how, uh, how that implicit mental model really works. Uh, in addition to the part that I have already shown, the lawyers were also asked a number of generic questions regarding their stance towards the artificial intelligence in general, as well as its usefulness in their professional uh, life. This part was meant to elicit the requirements for such systems uh, as, uh, as provided by the respective users. The, user, the prospective users, the legal experts, were asked generic questions regarding artificial intelligence and explainable artificial intelligence, and we have also allowed them to freely write what they expect from AI-based systems in terms of justification. Uh, as far as the results go, we have in general found the lawyers to be enthusiastic towards the use of artificial intelligence in law. Uh, the tech cloud, which was already presented in one of the previous slides, showed the phrases that occur in the asset most often. Artificial intelligence and law curriculum seems to have penetrated the ranks of the lawyers, as 90% of the respondents uh, see them as useful. Remaining 10% had no opinion and they were not negative towards the AI based systems. 62% of the respondents have acknowledged that they were already acquainted with the term explainable artificial intelligence. Uh, and 52% of the respondents believe that one has to understand the inner workings of the explainable system to receive meaningful explanation, which suggests that understandable explanation uh, that do not, uh, uh, that, um, that allow one to understand uh, the system's decision without knowing its inner workings is something that needs to be worked on. This concludes my presentation. We consider that the work presented here can be a basis for deeper studies. We had 21 respondents and obviously future work should include a larger user base. Explanations uh, can be tested using different data sets and other visualization methods and a more in-depth studies of lawyers conceptualization of explanations should also be conducted. Uh, most importantly, uh, we think that means of introducing domain knowledge to the explanation should also be explored. Thank you for your attention.
United States, for example, uh, when we had the Compass case uh, in, in the Wisconsin state, where uh, judges were uh, uh, were using uh, this uh, AI app to 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 give sentences to to people there. Um, thank you for your compliments. And of course, the question that you have asked touches the heart of what I think the artificial intelligence and law tries, uh, tries to do. Uh, whether that is possible, uh, maybe let me go back to, to the survey that we have performed. And the lawyers there, uh, when we analyze the answers that they have given, it can be seen that they had hopes that the artificial intelligence will take away the burden of manual work from them. They did not talk about uh, doing things that involve creativity or very deep analysis of facts or evidence. And uh, obviously this, this is something that needs a lot of work to, uh, to go. For, for the time being, uh, I think, um, uh, I think that uh, this artificial intelligence law tools can, can be used as a, in a supporting role and the, and the hardest cases uh, will, will be something that has to, be, has to be left out for the human. Also, I have talked about this uh, with my co-author yesterday and maybe Sashi would like to make a few additional remarks. Hey, hi. Uh, I guess this is Shashi. Um, Hello. Yes. So uh, this is a two-part answer. The first part is: um, Will the will the will the explainable system completely replace um, a judge's argumentation scheme or a lawyer's argumentation scheme? We are not yet there. At least uh, that that's the result that we gave or heard back from the from the survey surveys. Uh, but uh, what they want to see is their day-to-day uh, -day mundane tasks being automatized. And that is, so they can, their, their notion about an explainable AI system is something that helps them to complete their day-to-day uh, -day process, uh, but still allows them um, uh, a large scope of adding pragmatics to it, right? So it can help them to understand the semantics around it and you know, get the work done. Uh, but they still think that, you know, the lawyers needs to be there to add the pragmatic layer to it and actually make some decisions or you know generate arguments out of it. Okay, thank you, Lucas. Thank you, Sashi. And uh, we also have uh, another question uh, made by Jack Conrad. Uh, what would you say if someone observed that this work is already somewhat outdated? Since current modeling, modeling has moved beyond CNNs to more complex models whose networks involve millions of parameters and magnitudes, more training data, which would challenge any means to visualize the attention of the system's inferencing and decision making. Um, as far as the answer to this question go, I will also say that this answer should consist of two parts. One is the realization that, of course, uh, there have been more complex models uh, and the people have really went away from CNNs to a more complex solutions uh, in their world. And so this is something that one has to agree with. However, when one is... Uh, is considering those three methods that we have tested in this work, it should be noted that as far as I am aware, there were not many papers that have uh, compared those three methods. I am unaware of any paper that, that, that have done very deep comparisons or the ones that, uh, that are domain specific, like the target the domain of law as it is in our case. The Gratka method that uh, we have used uh, works only with CNN. And this is a, a something that someone who implements a system should have in the back of his head. 
that if one does not use CNN, that the grad comes is not useful. Um, I can't give a conclusive answer regarding the Lime or SHAP, but as far as I am aware, those methods are supposed to work with, uh, with, any, with any systems. So uh, I, I think that they could be used to, with, with systems that, uh, that would use something else than, than CNN, but uh, it, is, uh, it is something that we, we, we should look into to, to give a definitive answer. Ashi, uh, you want to say something about it? Hey, sorry, uh, I was on mute. Um, um, yes, a little bit. Um, so what we were trying to understand here, yes, um, there are a lot many methods, you know, the, the complex models are there beyond the CNN, right? Uh, but the variations in the results, that means that, you know, when you, when you consider a small paragraph at hand, uh, certain certain methods would mark only one or two uh, words inside the paragraph, marking them important. Uh, some methods would mark the entire para paragraph, that, that means important. Uh, so uh, when you're looking at the complete spectrum, that is when you're trying to understand uh, what is the perspective of a lawyer who's viewing it. You know, do, does he think that the entire paragraph is, is I mean, we're talking with the mental model of, of a lawyer. Does he think the entire paragraph is important uh, when you actually uh, talk about an explanation or do you think only few words are important? So this was also a very important aspect that we tried in, um, like, like Jack said, right? I mean, we still have to again figure out what are the other um, you know, newer models that could be incorporated and the same experiments can be run again on those models also. Okay. Uh, I think we are out of questions uh, and uh, thank, thanks Lucas, uh, thanks Sashi for uh, your insightful presentation and we can uh, I think we can now uh, go to our uh, third uh, presentation of this panel. Uh, we have now two short papers uh, and the first of them uh, will be uh, presented by uh, Professor Henry Pracken. Uh, Professor Pracken, uh, is a senior lecturer in the Intelligent Systems Group of the Computer Science Department at Utrecht University and professor in legal informatics and legal arg argumentation at the law faculty of the University of Groningen, uh, both in Netherlands. Uh, we also uh, have uh, Professor Bracken's co-author, Floris Bex, uh, that I think will uh, answer uh, the questions after uh, Professor Bracken's presentation. Uh, Professor Floris Bex uh, work at the Department of Information and Computing Science of Utrecht University and the Tilburg Institute for Law, Technology and Society of Tilburg University, uh, both uh, in Netherlands also. So, uh, Professor Brecken, uh, it's a pleasure to, to hear you. And whenever you want, uh, you can begin your presentation. Okay, can you see my slides? Yeah, yeah, Good. we can see, we can see. Are talking, uh, thank you. So our paper is indeed on the relevance of algorithmic decision predictors for judicial decision making. And I should like uh, to say beforehand that we are uh, discussing only one rather limited specific use of such algorithms, namely as decision support for judges who have to decide individual uh, concrete cases. There may be other uses of such algorithms, other uses 
within the judiciary or maybe for litigants or uh, legal researchers, but that is not the topic of our paper. Oh, I cannot move through it, yeah. Now I would like to uh, start with an anecdote. Some two years ago, I uh, had to give a talk at a seminar in Utrecht and another speaker was a Dutch judge. And afterwards she told me that uh, she expected that soon judges would have to use such predictive algorithms. Uh, and then if they deviate in a specific case from a prediction, they would have to explain in their verdict why they deviate uh, from the algorithmic decision prediction. And if they deviate too often in too many cases, uh, they would have a problem. For instance, the president of their court would uh, call uh, them into his or her room. Uh, and the underlying idea of constraining judges in this way uh, would be that this would uh, improve the predictability and consistency of judicial decision making. But our question is, is constraining judges in this way really a good idea? Is this really desirable? And very briefly, our answer will be, no, it isn't. Uh, and to see this, we should first say a bit more about the assumptions that seem to underlie uh, this way of thinking and this way of wanting to constrain judges. And one idea seems to be that a decision predicted by a good uh, algorithm, good in the sense that it perform, performed well in the test phase on the test set, uh, would somehow be the normal case decision of the case. That is the decision that any arbitrary competent judge when assigned to the same case would probably take. And we take that probability uh, we, we call that in our paper the decision probability, so which is a probability that this the predicted decision will indeed in this case that is now to be decided uh, be taken. Um, and then it seems rational to require that the judge can only deviate from the prediction if uh, he or she can point at special circumstances uh, in the case at hand. If, she cannot do that, then the judge should go along with the normal uh, decision. Um, but our claim is that a prediction of an algorithm, a decision prediction combined with the usual performance metrics do not imply such a decision probability for this specific case. A prediction does not tell the judge what uh, their colleagues would likely decide in the same case. And that is the main claim of our paper. Now, I will explain this in a bit more detail. Uh, there are, of course, uh, several quantitative uh, performance criteria that are often used in machine learning and also in AI and law, for instance, accuracy, pre uh, precision, recall, combinations of that like F1. Um, on this slide, we consider just for ease of explanation uh, precision, but our argument is essentially the same for other uh, of the usual uh, performance criteria. Now, suppose an algorithm in a new case predicts that plaintiff in the plaintiff in that case will win, and that in the test phase, 85% of the predictions of this algorithm were correct, so they came true. Um, now, as is well known in the literature, uh, good performance in the past on test cases does not automatically imply also good performance in the future on other cases that arise. Uh, for instance, that training and test cases may not be representative of the domain. Some of, or even many of the decisions may be legally incorrect or at least uh, legally dubious. They may be outdated because judges have changed their uh, practice, the way of uh, deciding, or more technical issue, the learned model may be overfitted to the particulars of the data in the training set. Um, but let us, just for the sake of argument, assume that these problems uh, do not arise. This is a big assumption, which will often not be satisfied. But anyway, our main argument is about cases where these other problems uh, do not arise. And can we then say of this algorithm and this prediction that indeed the probability that plaintiff will win is 85%? And our answer is no, we cannot say that. And 
I will explain that with an analogy with a well, well-known example from textbooks in statistics and probability theory. Uh, someone fills an urn with 85 red balls and 15 blue balls, and then we take a ball from the top and ask what is the probability that the ball is red. I think many, if not all of you will say that's 85%. And I think that's a rational answer in this case. But suppose now that the guy who filled the urn tells you, well, I first put all red balls and then all the blue balls in the urn and I didn't stir. And then you should ask, what is then the probability that the ball that you took from the top is red? I think many of you will now say, well, this probability is much lower than 85%, maybe even lower than 15%, because you now have extra information that is also relevant. Um, now, to make the analogy, uh, replace the red balls with uh, the case that the prediction of the algorithm was correct, and the blue balls with cases where the prediction was incorrect, 85% and 15%. Um, and what we have here is what philosophers call the problem of the reference class. And this is the problem that the, the step from frequency information about classes of events or individuals to an individual probability about the specific event or uh, individual, this was step is not automatic. There is a logical gap between the two. And in fact, philosoph philosophers have explained that applying a frequency, statistical probability to an individual case, uh, it ex in fact expresses a relevance judgment. It says that the only things that are relevant to the case at hand are what is stated in the frequency. So in the uh, urn example, the only thing that is relevant would be relevant uh, with the 85% frequency would be how many red and blue balls are there in the urn. And in our case, the judicial decision making, the only thing that would be relevant was is actually what is in the confusion matrix, so information about uh, how many uh, predictions uh, came true and similar information. But just as in the Erden example, uh, this relevance judges, well, actually, there is more relevant information, namely the guy, how the balls got into the urn. In a legal case, there is, of course, actually always more information because the judge always knows all the facts of the case. So the frequency that you could say uh, is based on the numerical performance information is simply not applicable anymore to the case. It doesn't tell what an arbitrary judge in the same case would probably uh, decide. So that is the core of our uh, argument in the paper. Now, what does that mean for practice? We recommend, and I should say I'm a little bit more strict here than Flores, who is a bit more moderate, but anyway, uh, we think that judges uh, should only consult algorithmic decision predictors that can explain their prediction in legal terms by giving a legal argument. And then, and this is my bit, they should only look at the explanation. They should not consider the numerical performance information because doing so can be misleading because again, it doesn't tell the judge what uh, an arbitrary judge in the case would probably decide. It doesn't tell that this is the normal decision that the judge should take uh, and that the judge can only deviate if he or she can find special uh, circumstances in the case. So going back to the Dutch judge, uh, this idea of constraining the judge in this way by algorithmic decision prediction is, is not a good idea. It will not promote uh, the predictability and consistency of legal decision making in uh, desirable ways. So my last slide, now since the explanation for the prediction is so important, the legal reasons given for it, uh, we also think that evaluating the quality of these algorithmic decision predictors should happen in a different way. We should focus less on these numerical performance criteria like accuracy and so on, and more on yeah, maybe more old fashioned qualitative evaluation methods where we maybe have human users who kind of give us insight into the usefulness or at least understandability of the explanations and human evaluators that can who can evaluate the quality of the legal arguments given. 
Okay, that was it. I thank you for your attention. Thanks, Professor Henry. Uh, we have uh, one question already, but uh, uh, I'd like also to, to make a question from myself. Uh, uh, you, you, you just said that uh, uh, judges should only uh, accept uh, algorithm uh, recommendations uh, if uh, the algorithm could justify uh, the, uh, its recommendation by legal reasoning, legal arguments. Um, for this to happen properly, uh, we should allow only uh, the use of open source algorithms because uh, if we uh, use uh, algorithms made by companies like uh, in the United States, for example, uh, we have a, a problem uh, for uh, uh, no to know uh, the criteria that uh, algorithm uh, used to, to, to make the recommendation. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, that is another important issue, of course, with the practical use of uh, such algorithms, but that was not the topic of our paper, actually. Uh, so I'm not sure if I can say much about that now. By the way, I should say, I don't, we don't claim that judges should always accept uh, the predictions when they are accompanied by a legal argument. You should look more at such, such algorithms as well, giving peer advice. So it's such as in the same way as we, maybe judges ask their colleague judges, what do you think of this case? And then they can discuss it with each other, but the deciding judge always has to uh, consider the, the value of the advice of if his or her colleague uh, on its own merit. Uh, so we don't even claim that uh, this kind of predictive algorithm that can explain its prediction should uh, by default be followed by judges. It's more a kind of, uh, yeah, useful information source to consult, but in the end, the judge should uh, perform their own thinking about the case. The other topic would be a, a topic of a new paper, I think. Okay, thanks, Professor. Uh, and we have uh, other questions also. Uh, the first one from Michael, I think, uh, if a judge deviates from a well-established line of judicial opinions or earlier case law, this deviation should be properly justified. Of course, algorithmic prediction is something else than a well-established line of earlier case law. However, let us assume that the algorithm prediction is adequately explained via some argument, our, our, our argumentation system, and this argumentation is sound. In such situation, shouldn't we expect the judge to justify the deviation from the explanation representing prediction? Well, the key issue here, of course, is how do we know that the argumentation of the system is sound? Uh, this, uh, in the end, the judge who gets this advice from the algorithm has to uh, assess the quality of the argumentation. Uh, but partly this can be done in the evaluation phase. This was the recommendation on my final slide, just like maybe the famous uh, evaluation of the Mycin expert system in the 1970s, where the quality of the medical diagnosis and treatment advice was assessed by uh, senior medical human experts. You could do the same with a predictive algorithm and then you could have some information about the general quality of the advice given by this algorithm. But even then it is in the end the judge's task in the case to uh, assess the quality of the argumentation given by the system. We don't know, it doesn't come labeled as sound to us. Okay, uh, a third question here uh, is for, from Bart Verheij. Uh, 
Can you relate to your position to the claim by Tolkien and Pollock uh, that probabilistic reasoning is not enough and that a form of the feasible argument is needed? Yes, I think this pertains to uh, the philosophical problem of the reference class. And it, it, Bart knows just as well as me that in the early days of non-monotonic logic, several uh, researchers indeed proposed uh, forms of non-monotonic logic as a way to uh, deal with the reference class problem. Uh, for instance, Ron Louis, who some of us still know, uh, said this was in the end an application of the specificity principle in uh, comparing and choosing between conflicting arguments based on conflicting uh, statistical generalizations. So yes, this is my answer to Bart. Okay, uh, we have also a question by Elton McCarty. Uh, your your argument from the urn knowledge is that the judge always know more about the case than the simple numerical prediction. But if the issue is whether a judge should explain a deviation from the numerical prediction, wouldn't it be consistent with your argument to expect the judge to explain what is about the case that is distinctive? Being a, uh, he, sa he says that he's, he's been a, uh, devil's advocate here. No, it's a very interesting question. Uh, I hope I understand it correctly. I mean, I think, as I understand the word distinctive, but I'm not a native English speaker, uh, this is what judges always have to do. They always have to say what is are the essential grounds and essential facts in the case that uh, supports their decision. Uh, that, that is what my answer uh, is. I mean, the judge simply has to uh, consider all the facts of the case and then uh, give the justification for their uh, decision. There is no sense of comparing this, I think, meaningful sense in which the judge can do that with comparing it with the, with the algorithm's prediction, maybe with the algorithm's argument, but that is uh, some, that, that, that could be done, that the judge, at some point gets the obligation to uh, say something about the argument given by a good uh, algorithmic uh, decision predictor. Do I see it correctly that my co-author is now answer, asking a question to me? Uh, I think uh, he is made in a comment. Okay. His comment is, I guess, that even if I think he's making a comment. Uh, Another question. Flores yeah. is not in the room, I see. <laughs> uh, well, we have uh, another question, I think uh, is the last one. Uh, a very common problem with the use of predictors of court, court decisions by judges is causing the stagnation of case law. How can this be avoided with algorithms? Who is asking that? Uh, yeah, I, I don't have the name. No, it's the, it's, the a person big, who... uh, it's it's a big uh, issue. It's uh, an often discussed issue in the literature, and uh, I don't have a clear answer to it. Uh, I don't think I I have to have an answer to it because I'm not the, a person who is developing such algorithms and recommending their use in court. So, yeah, it, it's a big problem, I think. Okay, uh, and, and this was the last questions, the last question. And unfortunately, by constraint of time, uh, we have to to go to the fourth uh, the the fourth uh, the fourth presentation. And uh, thank you, Professor Henry Drecken. Uh, it was a pleasure to hear you. Thank you very much. Pleasure. And and now. Uh, we go to the, the last paper, uh, a, short present, a short paper, uh, the last presentation by Aaron William Siros. Uh, Aaron is a postdoctoral post uh, research assistant in regulations 
at the Natural Interaction Lab based at the Department of Engineering Science at the University of Oxford. Uh, Aaron, whenever you want. Uh, whenever I want. Okay, let's share this screen. Are we seeing uh, slides? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Hi. Yeah, um, Marin Soros. Um, in addition to being a postdoc, I'm actually a doctoral student as well in the computer science department, and this represents um, part of my uh, doctoral studies. Okay. So um, this is, we're going to be looking at um, whether the prediction of monetary penalties for data protection cases in a number of languages. So the motivating question is, well, is machine learning able to provide some, you know, something more effective for data protection regulation? And for those who may not know about maybe the, the intricacies of data protection regulation, I have a very brief primer on what happens. So in two sentences, data protection creates obligations for the controllers of the data and it creates rights for the data subjects. So if you hold data, you have certain things you must do. If you if it is your data that is being held, you have rights against it. And often in uh, probably the most widespread model, which we'll kind of call maybe the European model, um, data subjects can complain to an external authority, which can then is empowered to take corrective action, including perhaps even penalties. And this is what we're going to be looking at. Data protection authorities have a few challenges. Now, the first challenge is that we are having increasing digitization of our society for better, for worse. And that means that there are more instances where the data protection authority needs to be investigating. Um, this is difficult because as you get these increased complaints and needs for actions, it's difficult to assess where the authority might be able to best use its time to make effective use of the law and policy. And compounding this is a resource disparity between the authority and the controllers. Um, this is true for any regulatory system. The um, regulator is always at a disadvantage. It is smaller, more constrained, has less information than that is regulated. And this is true in data protection. So we, Looking at, can we, from a set of facts, wouldn't it be great if we could give a set of facts to the Data Protection Authority and they could determine whether maybe this could be a violation of data protection law, something that they might penalize. And for that, we're going to use our data set is from Macau. Macau is a special administered region in China, um, so sort of less famous than um, its sibling, Hong Kong. Um, see, it's, in there. it's a small little jurisdiction. It's a former Portuguese colony, and that has continuing influence on the public administration. Um, most notably here is that uh, they use Portuguese in the legal language, and also that they adopt, and because they're a special administered region, they can kind of write their own laws. So they're not constrained by Chinese law. Um, in everything. And like I, like I mentioned, um, it's modeled. So their data protection legislation is modeled on the European model. So we have a little bit of generalizability here at the end for our conclusions. So in Macau, the, um, got the law is the Personal Data Protection Act. It's very similar to what you will find in GDPR or you know, the European General Data Protection Regulation and similar. It is overseen by the Office of the Personal Data Protection. Um, the acronym is actually the Portuguese, which is, I'm not even gonna pretend that the person is gonna make fun of me. Gabernete Protecção de Pessoas, Data Pessoas, something like this. And it's currently inundated with a lot of cases. In the last year, it had just a shy under um, 3000 cases. Um, and that represented a 60% increase on the previous year. And when you consider that the data protection authority there um, really gets through about 10 to 20 cases a year, um, that really puts into perspective, there's a lot that's missing and how do you prioritize this? And so maybe we can use some methods from the literature to see if this might help. Um, this is just a quick um, overview of how it gets there. So uh, kind of what I'm explaining. 
it comes in through one of these catalyst things. There's either complaint or referral report. They assess whether it should be carried forward. They, they then determine whether it's a violation of one of the three types. And there's different articles. Um, the first lot is about data rights. The second is about um, data security and confidentiality. And the last one is about um, publication of methods. And if you do, you end up with a penalty. And the penalty is not so severe like GDPR. You can end up with, um, I think it's like about 5,000 US dollars. I think that's the highest it can go if you uh, convert the money. So what do we do? Let's get into some of the um, experiment. So we collected um, just a little under 200, uh, 300 cases, 281 cases. And what we did was, what's very helpful about this um, data protection authority is that it provides each of their cases in three languages, Portuguese, Chinese, and English. But the English is unofficial. It's just more for what is useful for us. And we have, out of all of those, we have about 26% um, received a penalty and um, around us, the rest did not. And that's really useful because in other authorities, they only report on the cases they give a penalty. This one, they tell you um, whether or not. So then we get a nice binary classification test. We focused on the case brief. So the cases have the brief, like what had happened, the facts of the case, they have um, the analysis, and then they have their, 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 um, their judgment. Um, like I said, and there's no reference to law or policy in those briefs. So that's really good. It, it doesn't um, bias it in any way. Um, and there's a little example uh, for one of the cases, and you, it, that's just kind of how it kind of um, describes it. And you can see already the differences between the three language groups in terms of, you know, maybe what our inputs into the different models are going to look like. Um, English and Portuguese are quite similar in number of when you tokenize the corpus, um, you end up with very similar numbers. Um, the Chinese corpus is a little bit different, um, and that actually has implications later on in the results. So it's a it's our task prediction of whether a case will receive a penalty or not. And we want to attempt to replicate real world circumstances. Uh, we utilize what's been used. So we're not really proposing any new methods here. We're just utilizing them in this pipeline. And we want to examine the differences in the languages. And we want to highlight maybe the limits between interpretability and explainability as it's useful in law. Um, and so we take from previous literature where um, this has been used. Uh, we, we identified that SVN has been used a lot, naive Bayes, random forest. These are not, these are well-known methods. Um, I know that there are now language models we didn't uh, use. We wanted to see what a data protection authority could use um, really relatively kind of off the shelf uh, without answering any um, kind of new questions. So we evaluate the performance of those three on the different texts. So we have our pre-processing, our feature extraction. This is a common model for the, um, for the bag of words approach. We, because of our small data set size, we use a threefold cross-validation and we evaluate performance against common metrics. Uh, and then we explore sustainability. So here is our uh, table. You can you can go through a little bit more in the paper as you like. Um, highlighted obviously means the, that was the most performant. It's so it, it's interesting that um, at least in uh, F one scores, it's quite similar um, for English and Portuguese, and um, that Chinese is a little bit um, a little bit less per performant. Um, and when we, so we looked at, we used that the, the Lyme methodology. So, so we ended up saying out of all of those, um, because Portuguese and uh, Chinese SVM was quite good. Why don't we just look at SVM? So we took one of the folds in the model and this is just for a qualitative look. This is not um, to, to derive anything special. So we took, which were cases that um, were the same, that they all classified the same um as getting a penalty and what were the predictive features now because it's a bag of word approach uh the the, the kind of determinative features are a little bit nonsensical and um in isolation so in it's interesting so in, in this case was about um a photograph being used and published on a website and somebody wanted it taken down a company had been using it for promotion and they got a penalty so an interesting in portuguese and english photo is one of the biggest ones but in chinese um it's not it's actually um the, the first thing that's kind of positively putting to it is um the the term um which means to complain 
Um, and then the one after it is really an anonymization of the, um, it's a E or Y in Cantonese, which means kind of an anonymization. So we don't really have a lot of great reasons why um, we have a determination this way or, or the other. And if you look at some of the other features that contributed, um, they are a little bit different um, in Portuguese and English as well. They're completely different um, in the Chinese, though the translations don't all match up. Um, so when you have a multilingual jurisdiction, well, one, what would you use, particularly if you have two working languages, and whether or not this is useful for interpretability. So could you use these methods in data protection regulation? Well, actually, um, the, the, the previous um, discussion was kind of useful for it because, yeah, you may want to deviate from your, pre, your, your training on um, past decisions, but there may be factors that you will use that are um, different. There might be something that's, uh, that will qualitatively be different. And we would also argue that probably you might want to do this for case prioritization, but not necessarily for fully automated, full whack, um, you know, putting through uh, judgments because you're not going to get sensible answers and how can you appeal on the determination? You couldn't because um, you're not going to get something that's uh, meaningful in terms of an explanation. And some of the further questions that we had for our, um, that there was left a little bit open, but we discussed it a little bit more in paper. So what happens when regulatory priorities change? So your core, you have your training data is one way, but your priorities may change as a, as a regulator. You may want to um, focus on different aspects of the law, but your previous cases are decided in a certain way. Therefore, your system will now be less effective and already has um, pretty questionable um, performance already. And does a description of the factors amount to an explanation and one that can be um, used in an appeal or to argue against and um, yeah, in the bag of words model, no. We'd be interested in using other like language models and you know, BERT and their derivatives and start looking at things like that um, to probably derive some more semantic, um, capturing more semantic meaning. Um, so that's it. I think I'll draw it there. And um, like I said, you can look at the paper, you can email me some questions or complaints or whatever you like. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, we'll stick to the time as uh, Britain uh, uh, used to, to do uh, uh, well. Uh, we, we have uh, a question for you. Uh, I don't have the, the name of the person who made it. It's okay. But, With me. But the question is, uh, you mentioned in the article that the study is exper experimental and lim limited because of the data used. Are these data public? Can you increase your database to bring new results about your work? Um, so the data were scraped from the website of the authority. Um, yeah, the 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 plan, and if I haven't gotten around to making the this data set public and the other one, I, I ought to. Um, yeah, and if you were to increase it, um, you'd have to just um, pull the data from the website again. Um, they, they they don't uh, provide it as a matter of course. Um, so there's a little bit of um, faffing about with like web scraping and pulling that uh, data out of there. I hope that answers the question for our anonymous friend. <laughs> Uh, just to, to, to clarify for me, uh, to clarify the data protection uh, system in, in China, uh, there's a, a, a thing that I didn't understand. Uh, Macau has a, a, an independent authority, uh, yeah. independent from the rest of China, right? Yes. So the, it, it, is, it's, it runs its own domestic affairs, if you like. Um, it, it's very similar. They have a constitution that, that runs the, so they have their own data protection act, um, which is different from Chinese legislation. And it is um, adjudicated upon by the courts in Macau, not, not in um, Chinese courts. Oh, interesting. Okay, uh, and I, uh, 
and I see that uh, you you study uh, uh, regulate data protection uh, regulation uh, yeah. also. Yeah, and uh, I'd like to 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 know uh, if you have uh, uh, an opinion about uh, if uh, legislations like GDPR uh, can uh, somehow uh, delay the development of uh, of business uh, of AI business of the development of uh, technological uh, uh, innovations. Uh, what what's your opinion about this? Uh, so actually, it, it's an interesting question because in this, would even the data protection laws even come into it? And I'd argue probably not because you're not processing really any personal data, personally identifiable data, unless if you're not naming anyone. And they often anonymize the cases in the in these. So, you know, in this case, well, you could use it, and because you're because a lot of data protection, when they're talking about AI, it's like, well, you can't use the personal data, but these are not personal data. These are now previous data, but you're still having the same problems because it's going to produce a legal effect for you. Um, do, do these things, um, do they inhibit, well, the, the general creation of AI? I mean, that's quite a broader question. Um, I would say briefly, probably in some way, because you have to do a lot with it, but um, also difficult because, um, data subjects probably don't even know what they would be complaining about. Um, it just feels wrong that, that someone's using our data to do things and make decisions about them. And that's really the harm. It's not the fact of using data, it's that you're getting decisions made about you, you're being categorized and um, classified in a way that's opaque to you um, with no real way of explaining it. Okay. Uh, well, I think uh, we don't have I think we don't have questions anymore. Uh, That's okay. So, <laughs> so uh, uh, thank you very much, Aaron. It was a pleasure to, to hear you. And uh, thank, thanks all the panelists of this fifth panel. And uh, if, uh, if you, if you uh, want to, uh, to to go for a networking moment. Uh, we will have a break now for 30 minutes. Uh, so the, those who want to meet the other participants and exchange experiences can access the gate, the gate, the gather town platform for a networking moment. Uh, the link is at the open file platform. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. <laughs>